Hi there, everybody, and welcome to today's Art of Procurement podcast. I am your host, as ever, Philip Eidson. And on the show today, I actually welcome two guests. I welcome Geraldine Craven, who is the head of research at Procurement Leaders, and David Ray, who is Procurement Leaders' chief product officer. And in today's pod, we dig into a recently published study that Procurement Leaders undertook in cooperation with Bain Consulting to understand what is changing for procurement as 2020 approaches and what is staying the same. Well, in our conversation, we'll focus on how leading procurement teams are driving value beyond savings. There's a number of different value levers that we talk about before going deeper into a few of those different areas, such as supplier-enabled innovation. Supplier-enabled innovation is actually an area that procurement leaders has a lot of insight. In fact, David launched their supplier-enabled innovation center back in 2016. So as always, as we go into the podcast, I start by asking Jerry and then David if they found procurement or if procurement found them. So in this instance, procurement found me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a background in research, uh, so originally in social and government research. And when I recently moved uh, to the UK, uh, I found a role as uh, in the research team within procurement leaders. And I'm currently heading up the research team there so using traditional research methods, yeah. uh, but really focusing on the, um, the procurement industry specifically and uh, what's in store for the future. Okay. And how long have you been around the procurement community now? So I've been with procurement leaders for just under a year, so I'm still very new to the industry mm-hmm. uh, and still learning a lot. David, I, I, same question really for you as well. I'd love to know your, your kind of procurement origin story. How did you get involved in this profession? Sure, yeah. So I guess... Um, Procurement also found me, mm-hmm. um, but it was quite a long time ago. It was um, getting on for 12 years ago now that, 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 that it found me. I, I came from a journalist background, um, but I did a lot of work in, in the finance world. I, I, I reported on the financial markets and reported on issues for chief financial officers, um, also I had a stint in the technology world, so I was um, reporting and writing for um, a series of technology and, and technology titles and yeah. telecoms titles. Um, but yeah, so it was about 12 years ago that, um, that, that I got approached um, uh, to join procurement leaders and been here ever since. Yeah. Um, so there must be something about <laughs> the profession. It's one of those things, like um, I would say... 99% of the people that I talk to, you know, whether it's through the podcast or I'm often asking the question just offline. And I think we're all in the same boat. I was exactly the same as well. It's one of those things where you, you often, you know, you don't really know what procurement is and you find yourself there and all of a sudden you're taken by, um, um, you know, having such a good broad perspective, I think, of the business for me. That was one of the attractions um, that you don't necessarily get in other places. Yeah. The, the other question I quite like is, um, would you recommend a career in procurement mm-hmm. to your kids? I mean, that's always a good one as well. So, so what's your answer to that one then? Um, I think I would. You know, we will get on probably later to to you know some challenges to that statement. But yeah. I think it's diverse and interesting if you get to the right level in the right organisation. Um, so I want to dig into the um, the 2020 CPO planning guide that um, you recently published. So just to learn a little bit more about what you're seeing out there in the marketplace. And, and Jerry, I think the question may be for you really to start digging into this. Um, before I go there, I just wonder if you could share a little bit about the research methodology used. You know, who are the kind of folks who are um, engaging in the survey, just to give a little bit of a context for what we're going to talk about afterwards. Yes, so we partnered with Bain uh, in this instance to be able to broaden the network um, and make sure that we were really capturing a diverse range of um, industry, geography, and making sure that we were really connecting with CPOs right across the board. Um, And we surveyed um, and made sure that the the research methodology was reflective of uh, that diverse CPO Mm -hmm. um, or CPO equivalent uh, pool. And uh, the survey was an online survey that was distributed through our network and through the Bain network and available online as well. And um, we, we also, um, in leading up to the survey, had undertaken quite a few qualitative interviews and discussion groups with our, um, our network of, of yeah. membership, um, our members as well. 
and so the ref- the results and the the actual insights that are within the CPO planning guide are a reflection of not only the survey findings but the conversations that we've had throughout the year as well um, and and discussion groups that we've had mm-hmm. with our CPOs in the network as well. So it's a reflection on the topics that are really at the, at the forefront of, um, of their mind in terms of what they're planning for, um, but as well as the challenges that they're, um, that they're having to manage um, going forward as well. Oh, and what were some of those key findings that came to the fore in the report? So the key findings really are the the need to connect better with um, the broader C C suite agenda. So mm-hmm. really connecting as they're moving away from focusing solely on cost savings and recognizing they need to really change their value proposition and and drive more other sources of value for the business. They're having to align more and more with um, what those other objectives are going to be, whether that's um, innovation and driving growth or whether that's providing resilience and and, and, uh, protecting the organization. Um, Whatever is the the primary goal or primary objective of the C-suite or the CEO, this is um, going to be the key focus going forward. And it's what we're going to see as a result of that is whereas procurement teams used to all be very much aligned and all uh, generally doing similar things to drive those cost savings, what we're actually starting to see is a bit more differentiation. Mm-hmm. Um, so those those organizations looking and focusing more on the customer experience or focusing more on innovation or more, or more on risk management are all going to be looking slightly different and having different focus areas means different activities to support that. Um, so we're, we're starting to see that that little bit more differentiation actually between um, between those agendas. And that's interesting to see, you know, that procurement isn't necessarily the, you know, one size fits all. Whereas previously, perhaps we, were, we grew on that notion that, or, you know, we have a, a standard, a standard uh, process or procedure, and these are the things that you need to do to be a procurement professional, that it becomes more varied, but also I'd say, um, um, there's probably room for more creativity so that we can begin to really look at what the business wants and not necessarily say, hey, we're procurement, this is what we do, but more, we're procurement, how can we align with the goals of the business um, and take our lead from that? Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned earlier that uh, more and more non-traditional or, or different backgrounds are being attracted to the function. And that, in some ways, is a huge asset because having that um, that different view, having those different connections to the organization and different uh, backgrounds is going to um, enable the function to -hmm. to move away from that traditional, um, I sort of call it the shackles um, of the old ways of and old processes that can sometimes hold us back uh, for for those transformations that do drive new growth and new um, and and differentiation and really changing um, the way in which people are working, but also um, how, how, and what they do. Now, I have a question. I'm not sure. Uh, perhaps David, I know that you're in the field a lot, uh, kind of chatting with CPOs and uh, helping them from a transformation perspective. You know, do you see that um, when that essentially how are procurement leaders actually being able to change the notion of what, like the art of the possible? So. It, you know, we're moving away from, well, not if we're moving away necessarily, we're building on, you know, the traditional cost savings. But as uh, Jerry mentioned, some of those organizations are actually looking for something very different than cost savings. And so it's we're differing in terms of the value prop we're providing. The actual art of doing that, do you see that it, it, it's more, it's, it's easier to do so when you're starting from scratch, when you have a transformation and you're kind of reimagining what procurement is? Or doing it in flight as you are changing and evolving as the business changes and evolves so that perhaps cost savings aren't as important? That's an interesting question, actually. And I don't know if it's possible to say that one is a better route than the other. Um, I would say that cost savings for procurement will always be um, extremely relevant and it's never going to go away. Um, You know, by delivering against you know, one time in full, you know, sustainable cost savings, um, you know, um, managing risk, um, then that's the basics. But by doing it well and doing it um, efficiently, you're creating the credibility that allows 
you to then explore other areas and to get the investment to to you know to have success in other yeah. areas as well. I mean, one one CPO I um, spoke to recently um, in the um, food and beverage sector, he's been handed a you know a war chest, and it's a significant war chest, you know, tens of millions of dollars to go out and use as he he wishes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, this is from the C- CEO. It's been negotiated with the CEO, and it's like you know, use this. To go and not to go and play because that's you know that's being right. flippant, but you know, invest it wisely in order to drive greater value from your function, um, and whether that's you know through you know um, bringing in innovation scouts or um, you know developing new digital capabilities, you know putting in seed projects. To you know, to to experiment and you know, not not needing a, an immediate short-term return on that investment, mm-hmm. um, and and that, that can only you can only get that if you have built up the credibility um, to start with, yeah. um, and that you know that 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 particular CPO has been in 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 their organisation for, for 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 a little while. Um, they've been on a transformation journey, but I think most. CPOs will either be in the midst of a transformation journey, will be about to embark on one, or have just come out of one. So yeah. this constant change is, is all around us. So um, you know, to start from from fresh. I mean, I know another CPO who's um, gone into a to a US business recently and um, is kind of leapfrogging the status quo. Mm-hmm. So rather than working on some of the developments or some of the improvements that we hear from other organizations in the community, she's going, you know, two steps forward because she's able to, because there's no, there's no sort of um, foundations there that are proven difficult to, to, you know, to evolve. So I don't, I don't know if I really answered your question, but it, it's, I, I think the credibility that procurement gets from doing what it's supposed to do um, mm-hmm. at its core, you know, the, the traditional side, doing that well sustainably is very important. And then on the other side, it's also the, um, you know, the being a, the, the type of personality who is able to influence at um, exco level yeah. and exco um, uh, conversations because a lot of the areas that we talk about with procurement and a lot of the areas of value that we um, are exploring or hear of our members exploring it's you know it's a risk there's no there's no guarantee that you're going to get a return the the the, the there is an obvious um opportunity um and that to you know to get the investment for going after an opportunity like that takes good um you know you, you need to be able to put together obviously the business plan which yeah. you know CPOs are very good at yeah but you also need to convince those, um, you know, that, that, that C-suite that this is worthy of investment rather than something else. Yeah, they, and I think you did answer that question. I think maybe it was a long-winded way of talking about, you know, getting endorsement from the C-suites for a change in plans. Because, you know, oftentimes they only know what we have um, encouraged them to look at the procurement value proposition, which was savings-based, you know, because it was simpler to get, um, to demonstrate an ROI on that. And so as you not necessarily change costs, but build on it, as you mentioned, there's a little bit more risk involved because it's not a straight line of an ROI, but it's actually more impactful for the business so it, it 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 requires a change of mindset as well from from those who are measuring the value of procurement and how procurement is um is measured because it's not just a straight hey i saved this much money in savings you know and to doing a good job but i'm enabling all these other things that may be a little bit trickier for you to measure yeah absolutely and that's i mean i i was um very closely involved in the the launch of the supplier enabled innovation center here and when we set that up and when we started working with the procurement functions you know proving roi through investments in innovation from the supply base driven by procurement is almost impossible and mm-hmm. we've talked to tens and hundreds of people about it and you know people try and measure um uh, you know, savings as a result of this, try and um, uh, measure net trade sales, they try and measure all sorts of things. And it's very difficult to really pinpoint the exact contribution that procurement has made to, you know, a, 
a, a trade sale because of the SEI program that was in place. Yeah. Um, and that's where the storytelling and the and the and the business partnering comes in, in into its own, really. Yeah, it's it's funny. I often tell folks that you know you there's a chance of procurement not not being seen as a partner and even a, a risk to the the role of the CPO in that business if you hit all your savings targets, but the rest of the organization don't like necessarily the way you went about doing it, um, you know, and you've uh, created a lot of problems along the way in doing that. But very rarely do you see uh, a CPO losing their job, for example, or a procurement leader, you know, at a director or even an individual contributor level, losing their role if everybody in the organization is standing up for the value they create, even if they don't necessarily have the numbers to prove it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then one day, um, at some point, those numbers will need to be proven. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and you know, it's kind of business cycles, isn't it? So it's yeah. easier to get investment yeah. for something in yeah. in the good times. But then the problem is, is if that number take or that investment gets taken away, you know, part way through a, a program before the return is realised, then that's not going to come back anytime soon. Yeah. What if? You um, do? So you need to. Be, yeah. Yeah. So it's um it's in, it's it's an interesting um issue. So, so when we go into the report a little bit else, were there, um, were there any findings that particularly surprised you or that you weren't expecting? So I think one of the findings that surprised us a little bit is in relation to skills development and talent mm -hmm. because as we go um, into a period of change and transformation, uh, one might expect that the types of skills that are required would, would look slightly different. Uh, but the, the skills that CPOs are um, going to be developing over the next 12 months are, are actually quite similar to, to right. very traditional skill sets. So they're um, really focusing on stakeholder engagement um, and influencing uh, data analysis and um, and all of these skills are really quite similar to those that have been used by procurement teams in the past, but the, the difference really is the way in which they're being used or the mm -hmm. focus and, and how those skills are being used um, differently. The nature of data is changing, um, so a and, and quantity of data that yeah. uh, I suppose at our disposal to be able to leverage and, and solve problems um, and better interpret our either the supply chain or our market or our own spend and business. Um, so it's it's interesting to see that it's not necessarily a change in skill, but really a change of focus. Mm -hmm. um, and being clear on what that focus is, being clear on those objectives, is what's going to enable our people um, and, and, and procurement teams to be able to then deliver on those objectives. Um, rather than necessarily a, a change in skill set. Uh, so one of the things that Jerry mentioned there was about the changing nature of supplier relationships. And um, David, I know that that's something that you've been heavily involved in from the um, from the SEI at, at Procurement Leaders. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how are our relationships with our suppliers changing? And, you know, are you actually seeing that in practice? Um, yeah, it's, it's a key area and it's, um, we are seeing it in practice. Yes, it's still not um, overly common. It's not something which you know there's a, a, a heck of a lot of best practice around. But um, it's a it's a key area. If procurement is to successfully evolve from um, you know its 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 legacy to this uh, this position of you know real value creation beyond savings, then the the, the supply relationships have to evolve um, as well. We supplier relationship management SRM as a concept has been around for a long time, but we often hear that there's a lot more emphasis on the on the management side than the relationship side, and I think mm -hmm. this is um, this is true. Um, I think also when you look at um, traditional segmentation, um, that doesn't help because you know it's a, you know it's a, a spend volume or risk a, a approach yeah. to segmentation, um, yeah. and that's not always the the best place to start. Um, I think, you know, driving a partnership approach to how you work with your strategic suppliers, and when, when I say strategic, I don't know, I'm not basing that on a risk or spend mm -hmm. volume profile. Um, how, how do you work with those suppliers? How long-term are the agreements that you have in place with those suppliers? 
um, what incentives do you have um, in place to reward um, your team um, when working with these suppliers? What incentives do suppliers have in front of them for working with you as a as a buyer? So, you know, can supplier incentivization models evolve um, as well? And really, what we're talking about is getting to a position where um, there's um, you know, joint benefit from the relationship, and obviously there is, there's always been joint benefit. Yeah. But it's it's, yeah. and you, you get into a philosophical di- uh, discussion almost about where you know the power play, because traditional power, you know, in a buyer supplier relationship, for the most part, has been with the buyer, and that's been leveraged for for years and years and years. But you know, increasingly, the the size of the the pot is is probably bigger if you work more collaboratively um, in some of these relationships and evolve business models and innovate together um, for, for the greater good. And, and, that's, and that's something we are seeing more and more um, around, especially with those leading organizations that are playing, um, that are playing in this space that have alloca- allocated budget or resource yeah. to pursuing yeah. uh, um, innovation or supplier collaboration formally. So, yeah, we do see it. We see it um, in you know in only a minority of organisations, um, but it's definitely it's definitely a um, a um, trend. Yeah. So I want to ask a kind of a follow-on question. You talked about uh, you know traditional segmentation models not being a great place to start, and I I definitely agree because there's very little in those models that suggest the materiality of a supplier, for example, to whatever the the, the strategy of the business is. Um, you know, as you start to think about supplier enabled innovation and somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I want to, I want to start looking and working with suppliers to drive their our innovation and to partner with them on their innovation. Like, where do you suggest people even start? Are they, are they coming to it looking at, Hey, these are my most important suppliers and how do I have them be more innovative? Or this is a challenge the business needs to solve for. How can I uh, partner with suppliers to solve for that challenge? Yeah, I think um, I think all of those things, or both of those things, mm-hmm. and more. Um, there's, um, I mean, we've got an approach that we call value-based segmentation. Um, so you're 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 using a concept where you define the value that you're um, that you're pursuing, and that can be, be cyclical as well. You know, business climate yeah. change and sometimes you know you do have to button down the hatches and you, you do have to think more short term and you do have to deliver cash back to the business quickly and if that's the case and that's the value um position that you that you segment against and you change the you know the process um according to that but in other times you're looking for longer term growth or you're looking for growth opportunities you're looking for um you know maybe um additions to uh, the the product portfolio or enhancements to the product portfolio you're looking for you know to break into new markets to go to adjacent industries etc you know and all these these types of um strategic um uh drivers have to and when i say strategic i mean business you know at a business level at the at the core corporate strategy they need to feed into the supplier management and then and suppliers need to feed into that strategy for it to be truly successful and so you know yes you know category managers should make sure that their their strategies are put together um with a with a with a lens of you know the value that you're you're trying to achieve rather than traditional um procurement focused category management mm-hmm. uh, category strategies um you know so you know looking 10 years out in your category who are the the new players who are the disruptors what startups are working in this in this um area you know how ripe for disruption um you know how many ideas are you getting through from your you know your core suppliers in these strategies how many of those ideas are being translated or having an impact um you know the feedback all, all these sorts of things i think need to be um addressed more more formally um for for it to be a success yeah i feel like one of the most important things there as well is um protecting those providers those partners who you are uh, building stronger relationships and collaborations with when business conditions change 
Um, because otherwise you lose all the trust that you try to build up when you have done that and then business conditions change. And like you say, you know, at times you do need to go and find the cost savings where you can find them, but perhaps approaching that subset of suppliers in a different way um, so that you're not um, damaging all the trust and the, the benefits that you have derived from those relationships, um, you know, by engaging them, uh, engaging with them in a different way. Yeah. And that, you know, you, you need to be partners in the good times and the bad times. Right. And th that, that hasn't always been the case. And you can't do that with every supplier. I mean, no. you need to be able, obviously, you, know, you, you need to be able to, you know, sort of like go in and take, um, <laughs> you know, take a, take a slice of margin if, if, if required. But, yeah. you know, you, if you did that with a, a, a company that you don't, um, that's strategic, um, that you don't then, um, uh, what's the word? Reward when mm -hmm. times are good. Then that's not going to. They're going to go elsewhere. They're right. going to go to competition with, yep. with you know their yep. their ideas and innovations. Well, the the other topic I wanted to talk about uh, just to pull out of the report was risk management, and it's another one of those topics that I think that we have we talk a lot about as a procurement profession in terms of a value lever that we can pull. Um, Jerry, I mean, are you seeing that that's becoming that, that CPOs are investing more in risk management or, or kind of what's the state of the union there? Definitely. We're starting to see a few changes with regards to supplier and third-party risk management in procurement. And uh, partly, yes, um, to your point, as, as a value driver, as a new way in which procurement can offer value to um, the business in terms of building that resilience, um, but also to be able to... Uh, support that change in, in the relationships as well. So there's a couple of things that we're seeing changing. So in the first instance, they are um, procurement teams are, are broadening their definition of risk. So mm -hmm. traditionally, um, financial and operational risks were the key focus. Yeah. Uh, but that's really thing now to incorporate the market, uh, climate, nature impact um, sort of risks. Um, the political and and geo uh, geopolitical yeah. risks um, and and how you know tariffs are are going to be impacting. So being able to uh, be reactive to some of those things, but really also uh, much more proactive. So building mitigation uh, strategies in place and and what that means is that the, the again the relationships are going to have to change because to be able to put in place um, mitigation activities that really protect the business, you need to have those relationships with operational teams, mm -hmm. with, uh, with, with, you know, legal teams, with, um, with all different types of areas within the business to be able to put the right measures in place. But then likewise, um, the SRM programs are, right. are being used in new ways to be able to perhaps, uh, educate suppliers or uh, put support critical suppliers with their mitigation um, efforts to make sure that uh, because the reality is that organizations are more and more on the hook um, for mm -hmm. suppliers right across their supply chain so being able to firstly have better visibility and transparency of, of deeper down their supply chain is going to be um, critical to that but likewise you know, being you, you, once you have that transparency and that visibility, you can't um, sit on your hands anymore. You, right. th it does require that that active involvement and support of of suppliers um, to be able to support them um, and and put those mitigation measures in place. Um, the other big change from a risk management perspective is data. Um, this is something an area where. Data is increasing. We see lots of new players in the market um, either supplying third-party data or even building platforms to use that data mm -hmm. to create that transparency um, and those real-time alerts that um, we hear more and more uh, are, are, are entering procurement teams. Um, and what that means is that to be able to leverage all of the inside and the le leverage that data uh, the governance needs to be in place um, to be able to support that. So we're seeing some transformation uh, as well in, in terms of the way in which risk is being managed and um, and that all of that is creating more value. The one challenge for procurement who that is wanting to go into this space is if they don't have that endorsement um, up front uh, and if they're not able to communicate the value or, or 
perhaps the uh, senior executives aren't convinced of the value, mm -hmm. uh, it, it does create a bit of a challenge. So building that build business case around how mitigation of risks across the supply chain is going to uh, be the the insurance policy or, or drive that cost avoidance is key to make sure that they then get the support and the resources required uh, for that that high level of governance mm -hmm. um, and involvement also right across the business to support those activities. Because re realistically, if, if, if risk identification and assessment um, can only do so much, it's really right. those mitigation activities that are going to, that are going to um, drive the value. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talked about suppliers being so important in that as well. Um, you know, because when you start looking at proactive risk mitigation measures, that may in include contracting with providers in different ways. Um, to allow you greater flexibility when things happen or even contracting with suppliers who aren't necessarily providing something today, but they're there kind of on call in case you need them in case something else happens. And how do you build relationships with suppliers that enable you to get contracts like that? So it does make for a lot more complexity, but so much more opportunity um, for us to get involved in, in protecting against risk events ultimately. Um, the other thing to say is it's great to hear that we're expanding the, the lens of what risk management risk mitigation is because you know historically it's only been really those regulated industries that have taken a lot of those non-financial risks seriously and that's because they were required to by the regulators um so now that's becoming more and more kind of standard practice within procurement i think is is great because we can look at risk a lot more holistically than perhaps we did in the past so it's about time to start wrapping up the conversation i just want to finish on on 2020 so where do you feel the sentiment of the CPO is as we're heading into a new year, a new decade even? Um, is it a, a good time for procurement, a, a time for worry? What are you hearing and, and what's coming through in terms of the report? I think it's a, an exciting time for procurement. There's a lot of change in the air and a lot of excitement about the opportunities that will come from a shift away from all the traditional cost savings to also looking at other ways in which procurement can leverage those relationships with suppliers and that market intelligence in new and exciting ways. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, the the ability to tap into and use data uh, in in more and more ways as that the the breadth and and depth and volume of data is only ever increasing. Being able to use that in ways that can support um, much more strategic decision making is going to be an exciting opportunity for procurement. Yeah. Um, and then, likewise, being able to work and engage with with the organisation cross functionally um, in new ways that that perhaps haven't been done before, uh, and that those are going to be projects that are going to add value and and really take the involvement across the board. And procurement has a certainly a unique uh, viewpoint and, and skill set that can support those cross-functional activities as well. So, so just to add to that as well, I think um, that I'm hearing from a lot of the CPOs that I speak to that we are at a bit of a bit of a, a crossroads in the evolution of the function. That mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of there's, there are some headwinds out there which we will we'll need to address and we'll need to deliver against those in terms of risk and cost savings, but also. I think with the march of technology and digital, um, that's freeing up resource uh, in procurement or has the potential to free up resource in procurement and that that resource then has to be spent on more value-adding activities. And if that isn't spent on more value-adding activities, then it's going to be taken out of the procurement um, world. And that means that procurement might shrink unless we really go after these other opportunities. And those other opportunities are those that deliver strategic value to the organization, such as innovation, such as sustainability, um, you know, how we really work with the supply base to impact that area. Um, we've spoken about risk quite a lot, um, rightfully so. Um, data insights from the supply chain as well and making sure that we've got the digital capabilities in place to, to bring that into um, to decision making at a strategic level. Um, and also really harnessing um, uh, the, the ecosystem of supply, so not just the supply chain, but the, the supply network. So working with different tiers of suppliers, working with you know non-traditional suppliers, startups, etc. Et um, and that's an exciting but challenging um, proposition. And it's why we have focused on on these areas for our um, 2020 um, research theme, which is around aligning with um, C-suite objectives. 
and tackling some of these core um, areas in terms of driving um, driving results. Um, I really appreciate you, um, David and Jerry, taking me through the report. The, the last question that I have is if listeners would like to reach out, connect with you, learn a little bit more, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, I think the best way to connect with us is, um, is just to connect on LinkedIn. Yeah. It's, um, it's a platform there that's obviously uh, designed for that. We can, we can share a copy of the 2020 report um, for those who do connect with either myself um, or Jerry. So I'm David Ray and it's Geraldine Craven. Um, and yeah, we can share that report for you to, for, for your listeners to uh, read at their leisure. Perfect. Well, what I will do is um, I'm going to include a link to both of your LinkedIn profiles. Um, I'll also include a link to the uh, the underlying survey and report that we talked about today, which is the CPO Planning Guide 2020. I'll put those in the show notes, the links to all those in the show notes for today's episode. And that's going to be at artofprocurement.com slash episode 283. That's episode 283. So with that being said, uh, David and Jerry, I just want to thank you one last time for joining me today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hi there. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. You can check out all of our back catalog at artofprocurement.com slash podcast, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you never miss an episode. And if you found value in today's show, I'd love if you would tell a peer or perhaps go and rate and review by going to artofprocurement.com slash review. Word of mouth really is the best way to help the podcast grow. And if you're able to do either one of those things, I would truly appreciate it. 